So let's open up our Bibles to Psalm 46. It will be up on your screen also for those of you who do not have a Bible or do not use the ESV version. We, we kind of go through the ESV, so it's, I like to let people know so we're all reading together and you're not trying to figure out where you are because it's different. So let's read verse uh, verse 1. But before we do, let's just, let's just pray for the message. Father, would you minister to us? Would you speak to us through this psalm? Would you help us to see that you're in charge, that you are the God of all comfort, but yet you are the almighty, powerful God. And so, Lord, we just want to give you this hour. We're asking you to please quiet our hearts, to please give us an attentive ear, give us a desire to hear from you, and to learn from you, and to grow. So, Father, we give you this day. We thank you. Praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's read verse one. 1. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. That word trouble could mean like a tight spot. So a very present help in our tight spot. That's what that uh, Hebrew word literally translates to the meaning, the intent. And I want us to notice, first of all, that this psalm, it does not begin with a crisis or a trial as so many of the other psalms do. Remember, as we went through a couple of the psalms, it always went with, oh, here's what's happening, and oh, we've got all this problem, and you know, just all these things, and then boom, then it goes into the worship and the praise. But on this psalm, it's a little bit different. It starts right off. Right away with God is our refuge and our strength. A very present help in trouble. You know, for what we're going through right now, we can say a very present help during this difficult time, during these blazing fires. Our God is a very present help. This psalm begins with God's provision. You see, the psalmist, he looked to God for his help for his comfort in difficult times, and guess what? He found it. He absolutely found it. And I'm telling you, for me, when I studied this psalm, it really ministered to me that first verse that, God, you are my strength. You are my comfort in this time of need that we have. And all of us are in a time of need. Everyone is affected by this fire in a different way. Our thrift store obviously is affected. We've got nobody really coming in. But yet the bills still need to be paid. And so we have to trust God and know that he's going to provide. And you know what? Sometimes that's not easy to do, is it? But we're going to learn from this psalm some practical ways of what we can do and how we can put all of our hope and trust in the Lord. I want us to compare what we know and trust to these four things we're going to go over, which the psalmist knew and trusted. Number one, first the psalmist knew that God himself, and you have to really underline the God himself, that God himself was a place of refuge. So let's first define what the word refuge means. Who, has a, who wants to tell me, what does refuge mean to you? Let's get a few examples here of refuge. Safety. Shelter. Shelter. Safety. Trust. Trust. What else? What is Which refuge? Hmm? Comfort. Comfort. He's our covering. He's our covering. Anyone else? Please. Please. Safety. Hmm? Safety. Safety. He's tired from trouble. Okay. So there's so many things that we can learn from just that one word refuge. Now in the Hebrew, the actual original Hebrew language, that word translated in, uh, to, uh, to us, our English word, is refuge. And the Hebrew word is mahachese. It's hard to say mahachese. It's like you're sneezing. But it was the meaning. It was the meaning of shelter, hope, and trust. The only word I didn't hear of all the things you guys said was hope. So that word also tells us and means that, that we have hope in him. We have trust in him and we have shelter. So this psalmist knew that, again, God himself 
was a shelter to him, was hope to him, and that he trusted that God himself would do the very things that needed to take place in his life. In other words, that God himself would be his shelter, would be his hope, and would be his strength, and that he would trust him in everything. Now, do we always know and trust that God himself, I want to highlight that, that God himself will be our shelter and our hope in all circumstances? How about it, folks? Do we? I don't. I should, but I don't. Why? Because I'm human. Because I'm flesh. But that doesn't mean that we cannot try to make that choice. You see, you choose to trust. You choose to put your hope in Him. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more. But let's move to the second one. Secondly, the psalmist knew that God himself was a strength for himself and his people. Remember, the psalmist is referring to Jerusalem or Zion in this psalm, as we'll see when we get to verse 4. But do we really believe and do we really know during the worst of our trials, during these tremendous blazing fires that are going on, do we know that God himself will be our strength? How many of you here have ever thought that God himself will be your, his strength? I mean, I think for me, I was really touched by that because I never really thought of those two words. God himself is my trust. Now, this is the God that flung the universe into existence. This is the God who says he uses the earth as his footstool. Now, that's a pretty big God. And if he can use this earth as his footstool, how can I not be comforted and know that he himself is capable of being my strength? But what do we normally do? Well, it's me. I can't believe this is happening. What am I going to do? And we just have this attitude at times. Anyone here guilty of that like me? Yeah. And it's something we do. But I'll tell you, God himself will be your strength. We just have to allow him to. So if we believe that God himself will be our strength, then what does that tell us we are without him? If he's our strength, what are we without God himself? Weak. The entire opposite. So without God, oh, what are we going to, that's why we do it. Oh, what am I going to do? How is this going to, how are you going to take care of this? And i got to get evacuated and I don't know. And we just don't know what we're going to do. And that's our weakness. That's our flesh. But God can be our strength. I'm not saying you have this false joy and say, hey, yippee, I'm being evacuated. Yeah. No, that's not what it means. It means that you just know that God is your strength and you can move forward trusting him. You might not know how it's going to get done, but I can promise you, if you're a child of God, it will get done. Somehow, some way. I've experienced that. Anyone else? <laughs> It gets done. And we talk about this frequently, is that we have this delivery in our lives. God takes care of us, and we're just like, thank you, Jesus. Oh, I'm so grateful. I'm so in love with you. You're so awesome. The next trial comes. Oh, God, what am I going to do? We need to learn from our past, and we need to grow in him and trust him, him in him sooner than we did the time before. And then when the next one comes, we can trust in him sooner than that last one. It's a progression. Our life is a progression as we fall in love and we learn more and we become into the image of Jesus Christ in a greater way. Because isn't that what the Christian life is? That's what it says, that we strive to become into the image of him, into Jesus Christ, of who he was and 
what he did for us. Now, when God looks at you, do you think he sees that image already complete? Absolutely. When God looks upon you, he looks upon you as being done, as being perfected, as being perfect. Why? Because he looks at you through his son, Jesus Christ, and the price that was paid for you on Calvary's cross. And for that, we can worship him. Thirdly, the psalmist knew that God alone was his refuge and strength, not God and something or someone. Folks, I believe this is a mindset. It's something that we must meditate on frequently. Because if we don't, then you know what's going to happen? We're going to start to believe that it's God plus my bank account. Or it's God plus calling my parents for help. Or it's God plus the positive thinking message someone gave me to listen to that will be my strength. But it isn't God plus, it's God alone. It's the same thing about Scripture. It's not Scripture plus something else that gives us the truth. It's Scripture alone that shows us the truth of the Word of God. And it backs itself up miraculously, even though it was written by 66 different authors over thousands of years of time, yet it all comes together in harmony. And it is the inerrant word of God. God is our refuge and our strength alone. Not him plus anything else. Does that mean that you cannot turn to others for help? No. It just means that in your mind you know and you believe and you trust that it's God alone who's going to help you. And he may use others to do that very thing as a tool to take care of you. Fourth. The psalmist knew that God himself was their help, not from a distance, but from a very present help. So what did the psalmist know about this that maybe we haven't really considered? It's that he is our present help. He doesn't help us from being way up in heaven and sitting on his throne. He's present. We're two or more gathered there he is in our midst. He's here among us now. Not only that, he dwells within your heart. I mean, this is just some miraculous things that we must remember. We must keep in the forefront of our minds. There's a very interesting verse I found that really helps us to understand the importance of what we just talked about. And it's found in Proverbs 30, verse 26. It says this, the rock badgers are a people not mighty, yet they make their home in the cliffs. Now some of you may be saying, I don't know how that ties in. Well, what does it mean? The rock badgers know that when they're in distress, they know that they'll find their refuge in their home in the cliffs. That's really what that's saying. So when you and I are in distress, do we instinctively know to run to our home in refuge? Who is that? Jesus Christ. Do we instinctively know that when we are in tremendous distress that we must run to Jesus? He's the only one we can go to. He's the only one that has the answers. He's the only one that can give you comfort. And yet many times God will allow these trials to take place because we don't learn that. And we continue to go to other things. But God always wants us to seek Him first. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. King Asa went to the physicians first. The prophet came to him and said, man, God's ticked at you. Why? Because you went to the physicians first and not to God. All God was asking is, come to me first. Cry out to me and then you can go to the physician, but come to me first. That's really what, what we're learning here, is in our time of distress, as the psalmist knew, we must go to Jesus Christ. So we instinctively run to the Lord for our refuge, for our hope, for our strength. But here's a question I want to ask and see what kind of answers we get to this morning. How does this knowledge of, him, of us running instinctively to him... How does this knowledge actually become 
instinctive within our own lives. How does that happen? Trials. Trials. Going through trials. What else? Practice. She said practice. Practice. That's that's good, Marco, because that's what I have right here in my notes. <laughs> You know, it's that we exercise our faith. God has given each of you also at least one gift. Some of you have more. God wants you to exercise that gift because if you don't exercise it, you're not going to be able to lose it, use it properly. And if you don't exercise it, then you're not going to be able to be strengthened in it. So you must exercise your faith. Why? Because we, as the Bible says, are leaky vessels. And if we don't exercise it, all of a sudden it just kind of finds its way out and leaks out. But when we exercise it and keep it in the forefront of our minds, it's not going to leak out so easily. But that's interesting why the Bible tells us we are leaky vessels. Because if we don't exercise the things that he's given us, our faith and our trust, and our love, if we don't exercise those things, they become dull. They start to leak. Our love can grow dull for the Lord. Doesn't mean we don't love Him. Doesn't mean we're not going to heaven. But our love can grow dull and we're not being used in a way that we really should be or want to be. So exercise those things. In verses 2 and 3, as we move into uh, verse, those verses of Psalm 46, Therefore we will not fear, though the earth gives way. Though the mountains be on fire and threatening our homes. Right? We will not fear though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea. Though its waters roar and foam. Though the mountains tremble at its swelling. And then we have that wonderful pause. Selah. We pause and we meditate. So here we see the psalmist make this statement. In verse 2 and 3. So my question this morning is. What's allowing this psalmist. To make these statements that we see in verse 2 and 3. These tremendous statements of. We won't fear. Even though this happens. Even though the earth gives way. Or we're not going to fear. What gives the psalmist. How is he allowed to say these statements in verses 2 and 3. So fervently. And it's a one word answer. Love. Hmm? Love. Love. Faith. That's faith. It's our faith. The psalmist applied, and I'm going to use it this way, the logic of faith. Now, did you ever think of faith as being logical? How many here have ever thought of faith as being logical? Probably not many of you. But I want you to think about it for a second. We can call faith logical. And here's why. Because as a new creation in Jesus Christ, as we have that new being, as our minds and our bodies and everything has been renewed, the old man is now taken away. Our thinking now and our faith is now more logical than it was before. Because before, you didn't... What? You guys believe, what? You, you think that someone's that living in you? You're going to be transported into, what? And it didn't make sense. The Bible, it says, it's foolishness to those who are perishing. They look at us like we're idiots. They think we're, we're absolutely crazy. Were we all there? Yes. Yes. Every single one of us was there at one point in our lives. But, now, when we are a new creation, now all of a sudden, hey, that makes sense. It's logical. It's not weird. It's not bizarre. Boy, that makes sense. I finally understand it. And do you know why you understand it? Remember those scales that the Bible says are in front of your eyes? Now they were taken off. And now you can see clearly. And everything is opened up to you. That in and of itself, folks, 
is more proof in your lives that you need to hold on to. That Jesus Christ is real, that he lives and he dwells within you. He says that we will not fear though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea. Now if any of you have ever been in a large earthquake, then I think you'll be able to appreciate what the psalmist is saying here. I'm going to kind of get a show of hands here. Who here has ever been in an earthquake of 6.0 or greater? Okay, many of you. I lived in Southern California, and I experienced a North, Northridge earthquake, and that one shook really hard. But then the one that was worse for me is when I lived in Whittier, and there was a Whittier earthquake of 5.8, and boy, I thought my house was going to fall apart. I'm telling you, I've never felt so scared in my entire life. That it, I was, it was quiet, I was sitting on the couch just relaxing like everything's normal. And I'm telling you, I'm not going to make the loud sound, I don't want to scare anybody, but it was like a bomb went off. I mean, it was just like, boom, you heard this loud, boom. And the house just, oh, it just shook. I mean, violently. And I was sitting there going, gosh, I could barely move my way into the archway of the door. To stand in the archway. Actually, no, we weren't sitting. We were sleeping. Could remember we were sleeping out on the And we got up and we stood in the doorway there. It was scary. It really was. But the psalmist says that he wouldn't fear a crazy huge earthquake that could throw a mountain into the sea because he knew that God was greater than that massive earthquake. So what do you guys think about him saying that they wouldn't fear an earthquake like this. In other words, I don't care who you are, don't you think that an earthquake of that magnitude would scare the best of us? Yeah. Would it scare any of you? Would me. Right. I think it would scare anyway. So what is he really saying about not fearing? What do you guys think? What's he saying about not fearing an earthquake? What does he mean? Faith? Faith in what? That God's in control? I think, isn't it really, that's the whole, really the whole crux of it? Is that God is in charge, even though it's scary, even though we're going to fear, but then we can say, Lord, I know you're in charge of my life. My days are numbered. You've got everything covered. And that's really what the psalmist meant. He doesn't fear what is going to happen. Doesn't mean they don't fear the earthquake. But he doesn't fear what's going to happen because he knows he's God's, God's child, number one. And he, as we know, what's going to happen to us ultimately anyway? We're heading up anyway. That's our home. That's our permanent dwelling place. This is temporary. That's your citizenship. My citizenship, even though I'm an American citizen, my true citizenship is in heaven. That's what Paul tells me. I'm a citizen right now. I didn't have to pay any money for it. I didn't have to fill out any forms. I didn't have to learn any history lessons. I didn't have to salute any flag. All I did was believe in Jesus Christ, and boom, there it is. Stamp, you're a citizen of the New Jerusalem. And I will dwell there for all eternity. Does that not give you hope? Even during these times of trial and difficulty, does it not give us hope? He's saying that even through the scariest situations of life, we don't need to fear the outcome. Why? Because our God has us in the palm of his hands. And nothing, absolutely nothing will happen that has not first gone through his hands. Then after the psalmist says all of these things, then there is a selah. Or pause. Ponder this. Think about this. In other words, the psalmist wanted us to meditate on the thought of everything he just said in those three verses. That God is our refuge and strength. That he's a very present help in time of trouble. And because he's an ever-present help, we don't need to fear. We don't fear even if the mountains are moved into the sea. 2 Timothy, verse 1, or 2 Timothy 1, verse 7, tells us that we actually have the capability to do exactly what the psalmist says here. 
There we read, for God did not give us, this is in the Amplified Version, I wanted to really open this up. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, of cowardness, of craven, of cringing, of fondness, fear, but he has given us a spirit of power and of love and of calm and well-balanced mind and discipline and self-control. This is what God has given you. Not the spirit of fear of what could happen in that earthquake. Hey, yeah, you'll be afraid of the earthquake, but you're not going to be afraid of any outcome. Because you don't have that spirit of fear, timidity. You have the spirit of strength and power, self-control, discipline. As we move on in Psalm 46, verse 4 and 5, there is a river whose stream makes glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. In verses 4, it says that there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. Who knows what the city of God is? Jerusalem. That's the city of God, Zion, Jerusalem. But the funny thing is that there isn't, nor has there ever been, a river in the city of of God in the city of Jerusalem. Yet, the psalmist here, he pictured this abundant, constant provision of a river for Jerusalem. So, what was he seeing? Well, the better question is, when is he seeing this river? And we find the answer, we're not going to turn there this morning, but we find the answer, I'll give you a reference that you can look it up for yourself. In Ezekiel chapter 47, verse 12, remember, Scripture interprets Scripture. And in Revelation chapter 22, verse 1. And it talks about this river flowing. And really, it's a future event that will be taking place in our future dwelling place. It's going to take place in your home. What's your home? What's the term there's a three-word term of where you're going to live forever. Not heaven. I don't want to use that generic word because there's a three-word definition of where we're going to live. Who knows? God. Hmm? The house of God? No. Nope. The is correct. That's the first one. <laughs> Let's work on the second one. The kingdom. No. Eternal kingdom? No. Holy city? Pardon? The holy city? No? You're close. Any of those words right? How about we do it this way? I'll give you the first and the last word. <laughs> the Jerusalem. The new, the new Jerusalem. New Jerusalem. <laughs> See, you guys are smart. I don't need to be here. Yeah. I got it all. That's where we're going to dwell. In the new Jerusalem. And that is where that river flows. As you read it in Revelation chapter 22. A wonderful chapter that speaks about that river. The psalmist saw that life-giving river that makes the city of Jerusalem glad. Listen, why would Jerusalem be glad? I mean, it's God's city. It's the city of Zion. Whether past, present, or future New Jerusalem, either way, it's God's city. God has dwelled there. Why wouldn't a city where God dwells be happy, be glad? And that's really what this psalmist is saying. And because God was in the midst of her, the psalmist knew that Jerusalem would never, ever be moved, would never be shaken, would never be destroyed, that God would always be her protector, that God always was. Now, some of you may say, well, the temple was destroyed. Well, it was. The temple was destroyed in AD 70. But Jerusalem wasn't destroyed. The city was still there, and it always has been, and always will. If anyone says, well, you know, Iran might nuke, you know, they might nuke Israel, and that's kind of scary. Well, they may send small little nukes in there, who knows, but they'll never destroy Jerusalem. Because the Bible says so. 
and we can stand on that because God is always true. Verse 6 of Psalm 46, the nations rage, the kingdoms totter, he utters his voice, the earth melts. Here we see the awesome power of God. In other words, the nations can rage and the kingdoms can totter. God utters his voice and the earth melts. And this is just a wonderful poetic way of saying how powerful our God truly is. Listen, these fires that are here in Amador and the ones that are raging throughout these two counties, Calaveras and Amador County, even though they are so powerful, people have said they've seen flames 200 feet in the air. I mean, it's just it burns through the, the retardant, I was told, that it's just burning through the retardant in some, some areas. It's that hot. It's that blazing. But even that power is absolutely nothing compared to the power of our mighty God. And we must trust that. And as Christians, we needn't fear a fire. We needn't fear any other catastrophe that may come upon us. Doesn't mean we won't have them. But we need not fear. You know, Lori doesn't know I'm going to do this, but I'm going to use her as an example. They had, in the past, they lost everything in a flood. And it was difficult. But what has God done, God, God done for you now, after that? Maybe scared. <laughs> oh, he's restored us. He's restored. He's taken that which was lost and he's restored. God always takes care of his kids. We may not understand it, but God takes care of us. And sometimes he'll give you more back. In verse 7, we continue with some much, much needed comfort. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Selah. Folks, this is a promise. It's a promise you've got to hold on to. The Lord of heaven's armies himself, Jesus Christ, he is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. You know what a fortress is? It's impenetrable. We have a fortress around us who loves us, who takes care of us, who sees us through. Will bad things happen? Yeah. Does God allow them? Yeah. Why? Because of free will. We live in our free will, and so does everyone else. But God is there to protect you. Now, I want to share, you know, you know oftentimes we talk about miracles. And sometimes we say, well, I've heard of some, or I've seen them or I haven't seen them. Well, Harden called me last night and said he can't make it to church because of his smoke inhalation. That it, it gives him a bronchial infection and he doesn't want that because of a surgery that's scheduled. But him and his wife, they have a generator and when the power shuts off, everything switches over to that generator. And that generator only has certain circuits plugged into it. And the only thing that is plugged into that circuit, he tells me, is, and he has done this for years, is it's plugged into, you know, like the refrigerator and the freezer and some lights in the living room, um, some of the basic needs. Uh, that's really all it fuels and their um, pump for their water. That's really all it fuels. It, it's only 8,000 watt. It can't handle anything else. So Harden tells me that him and his wife are sitting there dying in the heat. They're just having such a difficult time. They, they can't turn the air on because there's no power. It's just through the generator. And he says, Peter, I, he was so excited to call me. He says, you're, so, you're just not going to believe what happened. He says, I was sitting there and I was praying, God, it's just so hot. We can't breathe. Oh, please help us. Boom. He said the air conditioner came out. I'm just telling you, that's what he told me. He says the air conditioner kicked on and it ran for about 40 minutes until it got to 76 degrees and then it shut off and it wouldn't come on anymore. The power didn't wasn't restored. He was still on generator. So how you know, I'll leave that with you. Now some of you may say, well, come on. Listen, God is in the business of miracles. 
He still performs miracles today. And sometimes we doubt when we hear about them. But my wife and I know of some miracles from people that we have seen with our very own eyes. And God is a wonderful God of comfort and miracles. In verses 8 through 9. Come, behold the works of the Lord. How he has brought desolation on the earth. He makes war cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Here we just simply see how the Lord is mighty to make desolation, to enforce peace, I believe. He's making wars to cease. It's like we're invited to look over the field of battle after God has completely overcome his enemies and their puny little instruments of war. And he leaves them scattered and he leaves them burning and he leaves them broken. I like what the Bible, what one Bible scholar said about this. He said, quote, Since God's people have reason to be glad in distress because of God's presence, how much greater will be their joy when the causes of distress are no more? Ever think about that? How much greater when the causes of distress are no more will our gladness be? We serve a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful God, even in the times of difficulty. And then in verses 10 and 11, be still. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. He wants us to be still, folks. To know, to know, to know that He is God. Why do you think He says that to you? Quickly, why do you think God tells you to be still and to know that He's God? So we don't try to take over. So you don't try to take over? Comfort Good. us. What? Comfort us. Comfort us? What else? Why does He tell you to be still and know that He's God? You can't hear Him if you're always busy. That's right. There's a good one. You can't hear Him if you're busy. What else? <clears throat> be still and to know that he is God. He says, I will be exalted among the nations. Listen, he's going to be exalted among the nations. It may not be right now because he sure isn't exalted among a lot of nations now. And we're losing it in the United States. We're pushing them away. But he will be exalted. And this is really speaking of a future time in the millennial kingdom when he will be exalted over all the nations. He will rule and reign from Jerusalem for a thousand years. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Selah. We're to be still and know that he is God. Rest. Believe by faith. Know that he's God. We're also to understand that he's the Lord of hosts. That he is always with us. That, he, that the God of Jacob is our fortress. I want to read you... Who, who, knows what, who knows who John Wesley is? A very famous preacher from the past. On his deathbed, the day he died, and this is what we're going to close with, and we'll go into prayer. On the day he died, this is what John Wesley did. Quote, On the day he died, John Wesley had already nearly lost his voice and could be understood only with difficulty. But at the last, with all of, his, of all of the strength he could summon, Wesley suddenly called out, The best of all is, God is with us. Then, he raising his hand slightly and waving, waving it in triumph like this, he said it again, The best of all is, God is with us. Guys, God is with you. No matter where you find yourself today, no matter if you're affected by these fires or you're not, God is still with you. And God wants to use you. He wants to use you to help others that are in need. However you can. And God will show you what you can do. 
And I'll tell you, when you do it, you just have this wonderful joy in your heart.